Hello, Mr. Weinstein. Thank you so much for accepting this interview. Are you ready to get started? I think I am. We'll see. All right, cool. So we know that you've been playing violin for quite some time now. Um, would you tell us why you chose to play the violin? Well, actually, I started when I compared to today's time, I started rather late. I was eight years old. And I grew up in a city that uh, didn't have much to offer in the way of music for the symphony orchestra or youth orchestra or things like that. So I didn't hear much music. But uh, we went to a family gathering and I had an older son who played the violin. So I watched him play and I thought, well, isn't that nice? Putting those nice sounds. So I said, I want to do that. So after that, I kept nagging my parents and said, I want to play the violin, I want to play the violin. And they thought, well, you'll get over that. But I didn't. Eventually, they, you know, at the age of eight, they got me a violin and started with the program. Wow, that's really cool. <laughs> so you obviously probably had many teachers over your um, musical career. So what were some of the most important lessons you learned from your teachers? Uh, well, I, uh, that's a good question. I was thinking about that. Uh, my first teacher was the teacher I had in the city I grew up in, which was Rockford, Illinois. And he, and, uh, he really helped me learn to love the violin. He did it by exposing me to a lot of literature. I mean, I was playing uh, within a few years. I was playing a lot of Mendelssohn Concerto and the Brook and the Vidiowski and a lot of show pieces. So I, I really fell in love with the sound of the violin through the music that I was playing. Uh, the next teacher I had uh, was the excellent teacher. His name was Adolf Pick. Uh, and my first lesson with him was an hour on one and a half measures, the Kreitz or eight group. And everything I did was wrong. You also said that so you served in the U.S. Air Force as, as well as playing the violin. So could you tell us some, a little bit about the service the service at the U.S. Air Force? Oh, the Air Force. Well, uh, I was in college during the Korean War. And fortunately, I received uh, deferments until I finished my master's degree. Uh, I had heard uh, from the Musicians Union that there was going to be an Air Force orchestra on the West Coast. So I thought, well, that's where I should go because then I can at least make use of my musical training. So I enlisted in the Air Force. And while I was in basic training, uh, the Air Force changed its mind and decided not to have an orchestra on the West Coast. So I ended up <laughs> uh, going to what was called band school up at an air base in uh, the Bay Area of California. I walked in. I was introduced to the warrant officer and told him my story. And he said, well, that's interesting. You're going to be a sousaphone player. I said, all right. And he said, Get, check out a sousaphone and live with it until you learn enough to play with the band. So fortunately, I got myself a roommate who already was a good tuba player. He helped me. I became an adequate sousaphone player and joined this band, which was a 74-piece <clears throat> fine band, very good band. Played tuba with them, uh, organized a string quartet, so I managed to keep playing the violin. And <clears throat> we played at all kinds of military functions and parades. And I ended up being the master of ceremony for when we played in uh, the local villages or uh, county fairs. So the Air Force said life is full of changes. Uh, not too soon after that, they decided to disband the band. And I ended up being sent to an Air Force base in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in Arizona for what was called a music activity team where a piano player, <clears throat> myself, and the warrant officer who played the cello and the saxophone were to organize a volunteer drum and bugle corps and teach them how to play drum and bugle. 
Well, we couldn't get any volunteers until we managed to uh, work out a deal where as long as somebody <clears throat> played in our dumb and bugle court, they couldn't be punished by being put on kitchen police. So we ended up with a very strange assortment of people, taught them how to play the drums and bugles and played for military functions and parades and uh, even played at a rodeo at a Indian reservation, played at a demolition derby, all kinds of great events. Uh, I auditioned for the Phoenix Symphony and ended up principal second violin with the Phoenix Symphony while I was there. <clears throat> um, with that, I heard you had the opportunity to play with the rock quartet. So could you tell us some like, exciting things or some aspects that you like, just some t like what, what happened when you were, we got to play with them? Well, <clears throat> when I got out of the Air Force, I wanted to do two things. One, I wanted to get a job, and the other, I wanted to study the violin again. So I enrolled in the uh, Los Angeles Conservatory of Music and Art, entered an artist diploma pro uh, program so I could uh, use the GI Bill and study violin with Tasha Seidel. Tasha Seidel was, uh, I think I mentioned before, uh, a teacher and as a musician had been in studied at the St. Petersburg Conservatory in Russia with Leopold Auer, who was the premier teacher of violinists during the uh, early 20th century. The very famous violinist Yasha Heifetz was his student and Tasha Seidel was a student alongside with Yasha Heifetz, who was 11 years old studying at the St. Petersburg <laughs> Conservatory. I wanted to study with him. So that was my opportunity. I also decided that I'd better get a steady job because freelancing as a musician didn't turn out to be too great. So I started taking courses to get a teaching credential. And that led me to UCLA. Uh, I was asked to play in a court, student quartet uh, by a, a student composer to play a quartet that he wrote. And we performed it at a noon concert uh, and uh, there was a quartet in residence there called the Roth Quartet. Barry Roth was the first violinist and leader. He came to the concert and afterwards <clears throat> asked me if I played the viola. Well, I sort of played the viola because uh, when I was in the Air Force in uh, Washington, I had a roommate who was an excellent violinist. Uh, a man who eventually became the principal second violin with the Cleveland Symphony for many, many years. We used to play violin duets until we ran out of violin duets. And then he said, why don't you learn the viola? We can play violin viola duets. So I bought a viola. So that was my viola. Uh, anyway, uh, Terry Roth asked if I played the viola and I said, yes, in a way. And I even had a viola, so he said, I want you to come to a rehearsal and play the Debussy Quartet with us. So I did. It scared the heck out of me because a new instrument and uh, playing with these people uh, were really my parents' age at that time. Uh, anyway, uh, he said, uh, we have a concert at the Biltmore Hotel, can you play that with us, the WC? And I said, okay, so we did that. And then after that, he said, we have uh, five concerts at the University of Oregon this summer. Uh, and we'd like you to join our quartet and play with us in July. This was June. Five concerts was 15 quartets. I had to learn 15 string quartets on a new instrument with a new group uh, in a little over a month. And I said, uh, being very foolish, yes. So I did it. And so that's how I joined the Roth Quartet. Now, <clears throat> they, uh, we played uh, every spring on a series of concerts at the university. We toured the uh, Western United States several times. 
uh, we toured uh, England and Scotland twice, playing at uh, what 17 different cities and 30 different programs. We played at London Wigmore Hall, three concerts. Played with um, Andre Previn. Um, strangely, even played with uh, the father of the hydrogen bomb, Edward Teller, who played the piano and was a friend of Harry Roth. And we played two Mozart piano quartets with him at UCLA and then in uh, San Francisco at somebody's home, and then even at the Lawrence Radiation Lab, where he was the uh, in charge of uh, experimenting with moms. <laughs> wow! So we, you said that you got your teaching credentials, right, to get a to get away from the freelance and the hardships of freelancing. So, um, like, are there any other reasons why you decided to become a public music teacher and administrator, or was that the only reason? Well, I wanted to stay with music. Uh, I wanted to have some kind of a steady job where I would have a schedule that I would know so that whatever musical groups I wanted to play with or whatever music was available, I could do that. As a freelance musician, you don't have any type of steady schedule. Uh, I enjoyed playing in a large orchestra, but I found out that as soon as I was exposed to chamber music, that I enjoyed small groups much better and so i was never interested in joining um you know a symphony orchestra as a regular profession i wanted to do something on a smaller scale i enjoyed the most of all was quartets i'm glad i didn't enjoy playing concertos i enjoyed playing sonatas uh, i didn't enjoy a philharmonic symphony orchestra i enjoyed a chamber orchestra I guess I wanted to be part of a smaller group so that whatever you did at least seemed more important because you could make more of a contribution. So that was one reason. Another reason was I was getting married. I needed a job and that was a steady job and a promised tenure. So I entered the teaching profession. The uh, first position was at uh, John Burroughs Junior High School in uh, Los Angeles. And I taught orchestra, band, beginning orchestra, beginning strings, and uh, beginning everything else, which was woodwinds and drums. Uh, I also uh, organized a, a dance band, which met during lunch and before and after school. And then uh, because we had some very excellent student musicians who I knew would get bored playing the music that the orchestra and band played because it wasn't up to their level, I started a chamber music club. And uh, it was very successfully had uh, string quartets, piano groups, all kinds of woodland groups which also met at lunch and before and after school, there was no really class time for it. And we entered a lot of uh, the, uh, the area uh, festivals and always did very well. I had some outstanding students. I had um, Leonard Slatkin, who became a world famous conductor. He played viola in my uh, junior high school orchestra. His brother, uh, Frederick, um, made a career as a cellist in New York. Uh, Peter Raito, uh, career as a cellist. Uh, I remember hearing him in the Los Angeles Piano Quartet. And he taught at UCLA, I believe, and in Arizona. Uh, I enjoyed working, obviously, with the talented students, but I liked seeing the progress with the less talented also. That was also important. But after 10 years, of teaching there and even one year of uh, split assignment at Los Angeles High School. Uh, I wanted to teach at a higher level. So I took at the exam to teach in the Los Angeles Community Colleges. And I was uh, given a position as instructor at uh, a college that had opened up just the previous semester, Southwest College, 
in South Central Los Angeles. And I uh, started an instrumental program, taught theory, harmony, music appreciation and humanities. Became a division chair there. And uh, after a while I was asked to join the first group of faculty who went to Los Angeles Mission College when it opened up in Silmar. As a young musician myself and many others like me, we always like to seek advice from our more experienced musicians. So um, what advice would you give to young musicians? Well, uh, the first thing is, uh, as a young musician, you do it because I hope you love it, but not because somebody's forcing you. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult, it's a difficult life and it's difficult preparation. Uh, practicing uh, hours a day, which is what you have to do, is not always pleasant. It's not always enjoyable. Uh, I, I, I refer it to as the agony and the ecstasy. The agony of practicing, but when something goes well, it's ecstasy. I don't have any regrets, but I know there are easier ways to earn a living. There are lots of rewards. Uh, you meet a lot of interesting people. Uh, you're exposed to um, some of the finest things in life, which is the uh, creation of beautiful music. So if that's reward enough for you and you're willing to have the discipline to practice and maybe give up lots of other things, then that's fine. And that's what you should do. So as a musician, you know, the continuous practice and performance after performance, you learn many composers and you get to know many musicians. So well, who are some composers and musicians you admire the most? Well, there's a, oh, it's a question uh, they say, if you were stranded on a desert island for the rest of your life, whose music would you want? Um, uh, there's a famous pianist, Monaco Kressler, from the Beaux-Arts Quartet. He was asked that, and he actually picked one piece, not even a composer. He picked one Schubert piano sonata, and that's the one he would take. Well, I, I need more than that. I would pick the music of Beethoven, either to play or to listen to. And I guess if I had uh, uh, lucky enough to have a second choice, it would be Mozart. Those are the composers that uh, almost in total, I enjoy the most. How was your experience as playing concert master of Chico and playing under my mom's direction? Well, first of all, I enjoyed playing in the group because uh, they were good musicians and very congenial people. Uh, for instance, I sat with my same stand partner, Barbara Poles, for all the time I was there, <clears throat> which I think was over 10 years. And that's unusual to get along with that with a person for that long. And she was actually kind enough to keep adjusting my music stand as my eyesight failed so that it got closer and closer. So that was good. Now, uh, your mother is a conductor, a very talented person, very musical, with a, a good conducting technique uh, and a pleasure to work with because she has good musical ideas and she works well. She worked well with us, um, being able to get her point across without ever getting angry without ever getting anybody angry at her. And for someone as talented as she is, uh, that's, that's pretty unusual. Usually uh, uh, conductors, well, there are a million stories about conductors and how hard they are to work with, but your mother does not figure in that category. So we're very fortunate to have her here and I hope she stays. All right. so. I would assume, but do you still play the violin to this day? Well, yeah, at 91, it doesn't get any easier, but I practice most every day. Um, 
I, I play in a quartet, um, the Channel Islands Tune Quartet, and we have performed quite a bit. We still meet now out on the back patio, six feet apart, uh, every Friday morning. I'm still waiting for the neighbors to throw garbage over the fence, but nothing's happened yet. So I guess it's not too bad. I, how I feel, I think I want to keep playing as long as I can uh, hold up the violin. So I don't know how much longer that'll be, but uh, I'm going to keep working. Well, uh, that's all the questions that they gave me to ask. And I'd like to thank you again for accepting this interview. It was great to talk with you. And yes, I hope that, I hope that um, you have fun. And I really enjoy all your stories and thank you again.